Welcome back to Unit 10, Lesson Trace. We are going to be talking about types of solutions and solubility curves. You will need your reference table. So we're going to be looking at the different types of solutions. We're going to be also examining reference table G, talking about solubility curves. We'll also be talking about when we add mass to our saturation. And we'll be also be talking about precipitating masses. Okay, so we're going to talk about what an unsaturated solution is first. So you've heard the word saturation before. Some of you have already been using it in class. But the word unsaturated means that we have less solute that can actually be dissolved into the whole solvent. Remember, water and salt. So water being the solvent, solute being the salt. We also have what's called a saturated solution, which contains the minimum amount of solute that can be dissolved. At this phase specifically, we're going to be having an equilibrium, which is going to exist between our dissolved aqueous ions and the undissolved solid particles. So we'll be able to decide whether a solution is unsaturated or saturated by adding more solute to the solvent. And until we see that crystal at the bottom, we can't tell if it is saturated or not. Oh. Super saturated solution is when we have more solute that can actually be dissolved into the solvent. There's going to be excess solute uh, that will precipitate to the bottom of a beaker and recrystallizes. And if you guys think about the word saturation, um, if you're into photography, saturation is the amount of light that is going to go into your aperture and your lens. So the more saturated you are, the more light that comes in, and the more unsaturated you are, the darker or more grayscale your pictures are going to be. Use your Instagram. Um, yeah, Instagram fil filters. Your Instagram filters is a saturation one. So let's look at this example. On the very top, we have 30 grams of sodium chloride being mixed with 100 milliliters of water, and we're noticing that we have an unsaturated solution. But below, we have now 10 more grams of sodium chloride, so we have 40 in total, mixed with the same amount of water, so we haven't changed any of those variables. But now we're noticing that there's 4 grams of sodium chloride that remain on the bottom, undissolved. So this means that you're in equilibrium between the solid, sodium chloride on the bottom, and the aqueous ions in the fluid. And because of the fact that we determined that there's four grams that remain undissolved, we know that the saturation point for sodium chloride in water is about 36 grams. Another way to observe concentrations and strengths of different solutions is again visual. On the left, we're noticing we have a very dilute or weak unsaturated solution of copper sulfate. But as we start to add more and more as we progress from left to right, we're noticing that the color of the solution is getting darker, which means that we're becoming more and more saturated. So now let's take out our reference tables and let's flip to table G. Table G is what we're going to be using for majority of this unit, looking at solubility curves. So on the x-axis, we're noticing we have temperature in Celsius. On the y-axis, we specifically are looking at grams of solute in 100 milliliters, or 100 grams of water, specifically looking at these two lines. What is this? When we then look at, let's say, potassium chloride, which is the line that I highlighted in purple, the slope, the actual curving of the line, is going to represent the solubility of the substance. If you are on that line, you are what we call a saturated solution. For each temperature, notice that there's only going to be one saturation point. So as you increase temperature, you're noticing that the potassium chloride line also is rising. But if you were to decrease the temperature, you would notice that the solubility line is decreasing. So that means hotter solutions can hold more material, while colder solutions hold less. So looking at this diagram, how many grams of potassium chloride can be dissolved in 100 grams of water if the water is at 75 degrees Celsius? So how are we going to figure that out? Well, I would look to see what we're looking for first. We have potassium chloride, so we find the line. Then we're looking to see how much water we have. Well, that's out of 100 grams. That's what the scale ratio is for the y-axis. Then we look at the x-axis for 75, and we should notice that we have a point roughly here on our chart. So if you transverse going upwards, 
to the saturation line at 75 degrees Celsius, and then going across to the left to the solubility, you would notice that about 50 grams of potassium chloride can be dissolved. So what the y-axis represents is that whatever is on this graph is dissolved in a 100 gram uh, beaker of water. And this is telling you that at this temperature, that many grams can go into 100 grams of water for saturation. Okay, I think I got it. Yeah? Yeah. Excellent. Let's continue. All right, so again, looking at table G, let's go back to our potassium chloride line. And let's specifically look at 80 degrees Celsius, which I marked on this diagram in the dotted black line. So we know that on the purple line, we are saturated, which is the minimum amount of solute that can go into our solvent. And again, this is just for KCl. We're only looking at the KCl line. But the same things we're talking about right now for KCl can be applied to any of the other lines. Correct. So what happens if you have more grams of KCl into our water? Okay, now, if it is completely dissolved, so visually it's completely dissolved in, but it looks like we have more solute in the solvent than that line represents, then it's what we call supersaturated. Okay, if we add anything else, it can crystallize at any moment, and if we have a supersaturated solution, if we irritate the solution at all... By the, shaking, by or, shaking or, or hitting it... Right at all, irritating it at all, maybe just annoying it but with just speaking to it, um, it can recrystallize and turn into an equilibrium between the undissolved and the dissolved going back to that purple line and becoming saturated again. <laughs>if you're below the saturated line? What do we call that type of solution? So anything below, so in the example of 80 degrees Celsius, uh, it should be approximately 50 to 52 grams of KCl that can be actually saturated in mm -hmm. it. If it's below that, then it's going to be unsaturated, meaning we can actually fit more into our solution than what was actually there. My turn. Okay, so now we're going to look at table G and try to figure out whether these scenarios give us a saturated, supersaturated, or unsaturated scenario. Pause the video, try to figure these out on your own. But now let's use table G, and now let's assume that we no longer have 100 grams or 100 milliliters of water. Let's look at the first example. In the first example, we have 100 grams of water. So everything that we would, we've been doing so far is as normal. For the second and the third question, though, notice that we're doubling the amount of water. And in the third question, we're having the amount of water. Therefore, respectively, you should be doubling the amount of sodium chloride in question two, and you should have half the amount of sodium chloride in question three. So right now, pause this video and give these problems a chance. All right, so you should have realized in the very first one, based off of normal conditions, 40 grams of sodium chloride can go into 100 grams of water. For question two, because we're doubling the amount of water, we have to double the amount of solute. And for question three, because we have half of the amount of solvent needed to dissolve, we need half of the amount of solute to dissolve. Remember, this is all proportional. So now we're going to be using table G again to determine the mass to create a su uh, saturated solution from an unsaturated solution. So all you have to do is find the unsaturated point that's given to you in the question. Then at the exact same temperature from the question, find the saturation point for that substance on table G. That means you have to just go vertically up the same x-axis. When you figure out the amount of grams from the saturated solution, 
you would then subtract them from the unsat unsaturated solution. And that difference tells you the amount of substance required to make a saturated solution. So let's look at an example. So in the first example, it says how many grams of KNO3 are required to make a saturated solution if you initially have an unsaturated solution at 65 degrees that dissolves 73 grams. Pause the video and try these out. Okay, so let's figure this out. This is what the question is telling us. This is the exact point on our graph that 73 grams and 65 degrees Celsius shows us. Notice that it doesn't touch any of the lines, which would represent saturated to us. Then we need to find where KNO3 is at 65 degrees. Okay, notice that it's way up there. Now we're going to take the difference of the two, and we're going to decide how much more KNO3 we can add to the solution. It ends up being about 47 grams of KNO3. You should end up with 15 grams of KCl if you did this properly. I am the smartest man alive! So again, using table G, now let's figure out how much precipitate or how much solid is going to come out of the solution when we change our temperatures. So to do this, we have to determine the saturated grams at the two temperature readings from the question. So the amount of precipitate, the solid that comes out of solution, is equal to the higher temperature saturation grams minus the lower temperature saturation grams. So let's try this problem. We have a saturated solution of potassium nitrate and it is at 70 degrees Celsius. It is then cooled down to 40 degrees Celsius. How much precipitate is formed in the bottom of the beaker? All what you have to do is figure out how many grams of potassium nitrate is at 70 degrees Celsius, which we're noticing is the sun on the very top, and then you take the number of grams found at 40 degrees Celsius, which is the sun on the bottom, and you subtract those gram amounts from each other. So you should notice 135 minus 65 tells us that about 70 grams of potassium nitrate will solidify and precipitate out of the solution. So looking at table G, let's go over some of the basic facts that you need to know. The very first thing is that all of the ionic compounds, which are found here in red, they all have a positive slope. That means that ionic compounds are going to dissolve best in 100 grams of water. And just so you guys are aware, all these ionic compounds are a solid. They're all crystals at room temperature, and they all show that these solid ionic compounds increase in solubility as the temperature is increasing as well. All the covalent compounds have a negative slope. And now these covalent compounds, which are all gases, we'll notice that they are going to have a decrease in solubility as temperature increases. On the very top of table G, everything that's on top, which is Ki, NaNO3, and KNO3, these are going to be the most soluble, they will make the most concentrated solutions, and are the least dilute solutions. But at the bottom, these are going to be our least soluble, they're going to also create our least concentrated solutions, and they're going to be the most dilute. Alrighty guys, so stuff you should have learned today. We talked about different types of solutions like saturated, unsaturated, and supersaturated. We learned how to read table G on the y and x axis. We figured out how to get saturation from unsaturated. We looked at figuring out the amount of solid that precipitates out of the temperature change, and we understood the basics behind table J. Other than that, hope you guys enjoyed the video, and have a nice night.